All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Impact Marketer. Today's guest is a digital marketer, founder and host of the Nomad Wolf podcast, having generated over 30K in profit through Facebook lead gen in one month, reaching the top 200 business podcasts in the US, England, Ireland, Philippines, Israel, and the 13th most popular podcast in Thailand in its first week. Being a music photographer that has worked with the likes of GEZ, Porter Robinson, and Cascade, capturing world-renowned festivals such as Electric Zoo, CrossFest, and Drop Zone, he's experienced life vibrantly through his travels, so much so that shortly after he graduated college, he took the leap of faith to move abroad to Asia to pursue digital marketing. He serves as a beacon of inspiration to those around him looking to push their boundaries and trust in their ability to make the unexpected work. Going from a lost college kid to a highly skilled marketer, podcast host, and two-time marathon runner within two weeks of each other, please help me in welcoming Glenn Gabriel. Hey guys, dude, Ronnie, thank you for the introduction that, um, you, you make my life sound cooler than it is. <laughs> <laughs> and he's humble. <laughs> so happy to have you on Glenn. Awesome to be here. So, you know, you freaking got to top 200 business podcasts. How did you do that? <laughs> um, I guess a strong, strong network and, um, I don't know, really good friends and family back home. Uh, you know, when it, when it comes to, uh, getting on to the top 200 within any country, um, it's just, you need to have within your first week, um, you need to have like a solid list of, uh, I guess, interviews. So I started out with, I think five to set, was it five to seven? Yeah, five to seven interviews. Um, all of them uh, very short, consumable um, episodes. And then uh, launched all of those on one day. And then I just outreached to so many people uh, asking for uh, their feedback, uh, what they liked about the episode. And just being like really open and out there with it, which was, to be honest, for me, kind of uh, um, what what seemed like a struggle in the beginning because I'm, I, I'm more of like a, uh, I guess a closed off type of guy. Um, I wouldn't, may, maybe I would say introverted in, in a type of way, but, um, I like to get down like one-on-one -on -one and I, I'm not the type of person that like goes on blast and says like, Oh, like, please review my thing. I, I literally reached out to so many people one-on-one -on -one and you know caught up with them caught up with old friends and and asked them like oh what they thought of my of, of my podcast and because i went deep with every single one um i was able to uh get maybe i think like 80 reviews in that first week and that really helped and um it, it's crazy how the the itunes algorithm works like you know most of my reviews were coming from Thailand and um, America, but um, yeah, because of the algorithm, I was able to get placement in the top 200 in England, Ireland, the Philippines, like all these random countries, even Japan, I think, um, which is wild to me, but yeah. So what was this outreach process like? Is it like, hey, a Facebook message? It was oh. all, it was all in the DMs. All the magic happens in the DMs. It, it, <laughs> you heard that first, ladies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like I said before, like the, there isn't too much madness in in the method or anything. It's pretty straightforward. I just um, had a network, and I also had um, my podcast guests uh, reach out for to their network if they wanted to. Um, but it's, it's essentially, I guess, backtracking to the guests, like you want to talk to your guests and, and pretty much tell them like, oh, we're trying to hype this up um, the best we can. That way we can, you know, get all of our episodes because it's, even though it's, I'm the hosting the show, it's their episode, right? It's their chance to like, um, you know, get as much shine on, on their episode as much as anybody else is in that launch week. So, uh, being able to communicate to that to them and then also using my existing network, we are able to kind of get some synergy and some lift with that. 
No, that's a great point. That that really reminds me of of virtual summits. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and the definitely. positioning. It, it's so interesting because all the virtual summit work I've done has definitely prepped me for this. It's mm. like just a very natural progression into podcasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the reverse too. Like I hope in you know, in 2020 that I could host a, a virtual summit as well. And um, I think the transition from podcasting to virtual summits or v- virtual summits back to podcasting, like there's so much, um, like they're pretty much the same thing. What one's, one's recorded, one's not right. Or one's video recorded and one's not right. You speak for yourself, bro. This is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Um, Hi guys. But but no no I totally get what you mean, man. One hundred percent. Yeah, I think summits are just like a glorified uh, podcast or like yeah. podcast on steroids or webinar on steroids. Yeah. Um, yeah, super interesting, man. I, I, a question I have for you because I battle with this internally is like, was all that work you did worth it? Like for the podcast? reaching out. Like, so you got the, like, what's the end game for your podcast? My end game, my end game for my podcast is, I don't know, I guess selfishly, I just want to expand my network and, you know, always tap into uh, minds and people that inspire me. And there's two ways to look at the the Nomad Wolf podcast. One is I interview um, location independent entrepreneurs or people that have been able to create their own lifestyle um, and then also leverage social media or the internet to help power that, right? Um, so that's, for me, I'm looking for other nomad wolves uh, to get inspiration from. It's also me being the host of the Nomad Wolf podcast I myself am just curious about everybody and I, I want to be a nomad wolf myself and just like, you know, explore. So I don't think my, my whole end game is, I mean, it it would be awesome to turn nomad wolf into a brand. Um, but I think right now I'm just kind of satisfying my own selfish reasons right now. And, um, being able to share that message, which I feel like is, you know, probably the easiest way to, to look at it right now is just being able to deliver value, uh, the value that I, I get selfishly and to share it with people who want to listen. And that's just, to me, that's as simple as I want to take it right now. And if it grows into something, um, and if I have the time to grow it into something, uh, beyond just a podcast or beyond just a virtual summit, that would be awesome. But right now I kind of, I'm kind of within different projects that kind of consume more of my time. 100% man. And I think everything you said is super spot on. Like there's always a selfish and a selfless reason to everything that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely resonate with, with one of those points, man. Cause yeah, like when I'm having, I guess the beginning of this week, I was having not a rough week, but I was having a very like busy week. I'm still having a busy week, but like I jump on these calls and I get so inspired. Yeah. I'm um, just naturally like, there's just so much energy going on between these calls. Um, and that was one of my reasons for starting a podcast was, was to be able to push these, these conversations into normalcy to hopefully inspire like, you know, the other person listening to this, which I hope you right now listening. I hope you feel that <laughs> setting good. vibes. <laughs> That, that's that's really dope, man. Um, and you know, I, I'm gonna bug you a little bit more on this podcast stuff before we jump off. But how did you figure out the name and the positioning and all that? Because I know a lot of people struggle with creating offers. Um, I guess with the name, uh, I guess I have a weird fascination with wolves, um, and I guess it. it so one of my biggest goals when I uh, when I uh, decided to take the the leap uh, to Thailand, um, it was a monetary goal, but it was it was a it was a goal that I set in my mind that would that's tough enough for me to reach and challenge myself, and also make sure that I wouldn't be going home with 
like I said on my previous uh, in, in the previous conversation with my hands in my pockets. Um, so upon reaching that goal, I wanted to get a wolf tattoo. And I guess since it's recorded, I can show it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. So. Nice. This is on yeah. his left, left forearm for everyone listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Um, my mom's probably, maybe my mom's one of my biggest fans. Like who, who, whose mom isn't, right? <laughs> um, she's not the fan of, she's not a fan of tattoos at all. I mean, Filipino household, she's like anybody with a tattoo, like maybe, uh, maybe there's something wrong with them. Um, but anyways, like I positioned it in a way as a true marketer would, right? I positioned it in a way where every tattoo that I get, I have to earn, right? It's almost like a badge. Um, so this was my first one and I set the goal uh, so big that I was like, if I reach this goal, then I deserve to have this wolf tattoo on me, right? Um, I, and I, I guess that same ethos kind of translated into um, my first marathon, my second marathon, and then I don't know why everything's with a marathon now, but every marathon <laughs> that I've done, um, I've also gotten a tattoo uh, within that country. But um, yeah, so that first that first tattoo was a, a wolf tattoo, and I've always been um, interested in the whole digital nomad lifestyle. And also, uh, you know, there's a ton of online entrepreneurs out there making a, uh, making their own lives and careers just built on systems and and things online. So for me to explore that, I, I feel like is sort of the nomad ethos. So integrating both of those two things seemed uh, to me quite cool. And yeah, I, I guess, you know, if, if I can outreach to more Nomad Wolves and, um, you know, cr like I said before, create a brand out of it, that would be one, probably one of the coolest brands out there, in my opinion. Me too, I agree. Um, this monetary goal, what was it? Um, it was making it, I guess you introduced it earlier in, in the show, but it was making 30 K profit for on, on Facebook lead Legion. Can you walk me through that story? Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll share a little bit of it. Um, so back in the days, uh, Jeez, do I want to share? Do I want to share some of this? Um, walk, walk me through like your part in in the story, I guess. Like, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I moved out here, I was um, essentially part of uh, my buddy's uh, my buddy's company where we were uh, Facebook media buyers, and we were in charge of pretty much setting setting up the whole uh, strategy to create more leads for one of their clients. Uh, the, the whole strategy is we're buying uh, Facebook traffic, we're creating the pre-sale uh, landing pages, and we're doing all of the image, headline, um, and all the testing within it, so that once the person comes from uh, the Facebook um, newsfeed to the, the actual uh, advertiser's landing page, they would convert. Right, um, pretty pretty standard affiliate marketing there. Um, so when it came to, and I guess one of the biggest lessons that I turned uh, that I got from that whole experience was being able to scale horizontally. So once you actually had a winning angle or a winning presale uh, with all the images tested, with all the headlines tested, and you're getting amazing. Um, uh, CTR and also super low CTCs in one country, we would translate that um, using one hour translation into several different countries languages and then start running those campaigns in other other languages um, if the advertiser allows for it. Um, so that's what I mean by scaling horizontally. So once you actually had like a creative, um, creative copy in 
all, all of your ducks in a row, then you would just scale that pretty much around the world. And as long as the affiliate payout is quite good, um, you could really, uh, you could really make, uh, some good money with that. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you left the affiliate world. Um, and I know to a lot of people, especially like new marketers, that's a very sexy thing. Can you, can you talk about like why you grew away from it? Well, the affiliate world is, you're not really building too much of an asset. I feel like, um, like you yourself don't own the offers that affiliate networks broker, right? Um, the affiliate world is also somewhat sketchy in, uh, you know, I guess the, the people that you interface with, like I've heard of affiliate networks not being able to pay out certain affiliates, even though that they've spent their own money running traffic and they've garnered this many leads, you know, some affiliate, uh, companies just like go quiet or, you know, literally pull out of the deal. Like there isn't, there aren't too many rules there that kind of hold the affiliate industry up to a certain sort of standard. Um, and then, like I said before, you're kind of on this weird, like hamster wheel of it's like, well, this offer is hot for maybe like three months. And then you might need to find another offer because that advertiser just decides to not give the network any more cap or anything. So yeah, you're the only skill set is probably your marketing experience and the systems that you're able to build with that. But, um, when it comes to finding new offers, offers that might go, go stale, um, you don't really get to have that. And that's why most of us pivoted to e-commerce and sourcing our own um, suppliers and uh, trying to build up these little micro brands is because we're trying to actually build an, uh, uh, an asset and um, being able to ha actually have products uh, that actually serve customers and um, it isn't just a lead anymore. It's more like, oh, they actually, you know, have a problem. This product solves it. Um, and then hopefully grow that into a brand. Right. So is that, is that what you're currently doing? You have a e-commerce brand? Yeah. So we actually have, um, I guess several micro brands. Um, one's like a pet safety brand. One's like a security, uh, wallet type of type of brand um what, what other brands do we have i i guess those two are like our main ones and then we also still uh do some uh single product funnel drop shipping type of stuff and what's been your experience with that um well the transition from affiliate to this has been um well, with affiliate, you're kind of on your own. You're making the angles, doing the, doing, setting up the whole thing, right, from start to finish. And that was cool because, like, you're pretty entrepreneurial in your sense. Yet you had full creative control over the whole thing, and also your Facebook media buying. When it came to the e-commerce uh, company, uh, everything kind of turned into different silos. Like for me right now, I'm in charge of creative messaging um and testing out different video ads because that's like probably one of my strengths right and then we actually have a another guy who's primarily focused on facebook media buying and then one that's pm and you know it, it's actually turned into a full-fledged uh company out here in thailand now where everybody has specific roles that they're particularly good at um and that's you know that that's good and it's bad because like one, it's like you're focusing on your one thing, which is like really, really good. Two, it's like, I don't know, things can kind of get stale sometimes because like you're only focusing on that one thing. Um, and we're all like entrepreneurial in the sense where it's like, well, you know, you kind of want to like learn a little bit about everything, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, there's sacrifices and there's pros to to setting up the whole e-commerce thing. How long have you been doing this? Um, 
the commerce maybe about a year now. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And this, this, you know, innate need to express as an entrepreneur, what have you been doing about that? Um, so one was the podcast. Um, by being able to uh, network and just pick the minds of other people that are doing different stuff, that has been a really big catalyst in terms of um, just being able to explore and just learn about what other marketers or entrepreneurs are doing. And then um, along on the other side of that, I'm also setting up my own, um, my own agency. Um, and I'm also helping with uh, you and Eric's, Eric Yang's agency, uh, Lead Next Gen. So I kind of have my, I, I'm definitely satisfying a, a huge need of like learning and picking up different things and being in the perspective of um, other types of people. And I think that's the only way that you're able to, or one of the ways that you're able to kind of grow is by being able to put yourself into the shoes of other people and understand, um, you know, what they're up against and also help in other sort of capacities um, and essentially, essentially grow. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely happy to satisfy um, my, my different needs in, in, in terms of, in terms of that. On that notion, um, what's been your takeaways from working with me and Eric? Um, high performance, high, being part of a high performing team. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's humbling and it's also pretty fucking cool. We can cuss here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, like I am just in awe of you two because you got, and also Lauren as well. Shout out Lauren. Um, <laughs> all of you guys are so young. I mean, you guys are around like what, 24 years old, right? And I'm yeah. 30. Um, I, I, I'm the old, the old kid, the old man in, part, in, in the group, <laughs> a seasoned veteran, if, if, <laughs> if you want to call me that. But yeah. um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just so in awe of you guys and how f functioning or highly functioning you guys are. And so organized and it, it just seems like i don't know I, I i met eric when you know four four years prior so like when he was like 19 or 20 and from the get-go like he was you know so set on like what he wanted to do uh he wanted to host his his own um actual event and you know back when i was 19 i was kind of just like oh like let's just go out and let's just go have fun, you know? Um, but yeah, like being part of uh, you and Eric's uh, team has really uh, put in a lot of perspective that um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter like what age you are, like as long as you know where you want to go, um, you can always just pretty much put in place the, the steps and then just attack. And I feel like, you know, when it comes to building a virtual summit or, you know, building your own personal brand, like as long as like, you know, where you want to go, there's always systems and, and processes that will get you there. It's just being able to see that roadmap and then just tackle things day by day. Yeah. And what I've learned along the way as well is when you know where you're going, you become a natural leader and people want to help. Hmm. That's huge. You have a flashlight yeah. and you're like, Hey, this is the way to go. Yeah. 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 That's huge. That's huge. Um, no, man, that's, that means a lot. That really does. Um, and uh, Ronnie, I think you got muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. No. Right. Um, yeah, that means a lot, dude. That really does. Um, I'm super excited. I know Eric is too, like super excited to grow this agency with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think you're super sharp, bro. And we've already talked in private. Like I see you being a massive leader in our agency. Uh, so I'm super, super fucking I appreciate that. that, bro. <laughs> yeah. I'm stoked to be part of this team. And I mean, I, I believe in every single uh, person within the team. So, and I think that's, that's essential. And I, I got that vibe um, 
super early on, maybe like after our first meeting, it was just like seeing how you guys work together, seeing how you guys support each other. Um, it's just awesome to, to see and uh, to, I don't know, to see it at such a young age too, I just feel like is, I don't know, I just feel, I, I just feel really good about this whole collaborative environment, so. So um, just so, you know, our listeners can have a better feel for this, how does our, our culture at, with our agency compare to your work experiences before? Um, I don't know. I, I just feel like it's a little less corporate. Um, I mean, obviously there's, there's still structure, right? Uh, one of the biggest things that, uh, maybe I can commend Eric on is the fact that he knows that because we're all entrepreneurial, we want to build our own things on the side. Right. Um, and he's always been vocal about supporting that. You know, for example, Ronnie, you want to build, uh, along with Impact Marketer, you want to build your own agency, right? Um, and whatever skill sets um, that will help build your own agency, uh, Eric will definitely uh, try to provide or at least make sure that you're still going into the direction that you want to head in. Right. Same goes for Lauren. Same goes for me. Um, like we all want to build our own, our own agencies or our own, or our own personal brands on the side. And he has like no, no problem with that. If anything, he wants to help with that. Right. Um, obviously he wants it to be beneficial for both of us. Right. So whatever skill set that we have that we can bring to the table for the lead next gen, um, Obviously, that's going to be huge, but as long as we're also satisfying our own need to be able to play outside of lead next gen, it's probably the biggest the biggest culture thing that um, is probably available that I haven't seen available in any of my past experiences. Yeah, and we we definitely piggybacked off Gary Vee's thing, which is like empower the employee so much where they can leave you at any moment, but they don't want to because of like the relationship and also because they know they won't be treated as well like anywhere else. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's fascinating, man. Like, is I, this is a very startup feel like how nimble we are and just how, I guess like how in the trenches we are as well, but we love it because mm -hmm. there's like camaraderie there. Oh um, yeah, definitely. And I, I've grown so much in this environment because there's like a level of, of trust that comes into play. Um, mm -hmm. and, and albeit like, yeah, I, I am in a leadership position and I like, I love being in a leadership position. So that, so that the trust and that helps as well. Um, but like just caring about the people as authentically as we do, you know, it's, it helps so much for growth and in terms of skill acquisition, like, like I was saying on like our, our meeting earlier, like, yeah, I spent three days to learn how to build a sales system. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like, I loved every, every minute of it um, because yeah. I knew what I was doing it for. And I knew, you know, again, like knowing where we're going, I see, I can in, like, visualize exactly what this is going to build out to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you showing that I was like, damn dude, like if you were going to sell it, like I would, I would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> 197 dude so cheap <laughs> <laughs> yeah man like it was so difficult to find everything i was finding online i think because it's changing so rapidly everything was like there's one part broken of everything i was trying to do and i was like oh this is so frustrating um yeah. and yeah like if you guys saw where i was on sunday you guys would have laughed at me <laughs> Um, just like uh, I have this box <laughs> and then this box and that, that's it yeah uh, so to give the listeners context I, I essentially was working on um, a sales system an automated sales system for the agency which is ba which combined like a CRM which basically allows you to manage your contacts as they come into your ecosystem um, as well as like the automated emails that come on the back end um, and we essentially have just learn that you, you need these systems in place because you know we're humans and humans have variants and people are going to drop off like 
they need to be kept up with. Um, there's no amount of intent behind it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really hoping that this catches a lot of the leads that have come our way and, and we let them slip to the cracks or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's exciting. What are your thoughts on um, also integrating a uh, many chat sales sequence on top of your active campaign sales sequence? I'm super open to it. Um, yeah, we so, should definitely talk. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted this just to be like the skeleton. Mm, of course. This is just the foundation, man. And, and then this can become so many things like the, the front end offer. Um, so right now, I, I think the listeners will find value in this. Like the current offer we're running is have, first off, understand the avatar. What's their top of mind pain? Um, and then develop something consumable, but also desirable. So like a one to two page, highly valuable and actionable PDF. Um, when someone registers to get that PDF, they get thrown onto a thank you page um, that has a special offer for like a $300 call for free with our agency. Um, and so the minute they apply and book that call is when they enter the sales ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, like that's only one offer. And then I just, you know, this is malleable. It can be used for every single offer at this point. Um, yeah. I just know Eric's been trying to do sales, but he doesn't have a CRM, which is like absolute nonsense to do sales without mm. this. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Um, you know, getting just, into, just, go ahead. Just curious. Um, when it comes to people seeing this PDF, are you running ads or are you just posting it into groups or like, what is, how, how do people see the, uh, that there is a PDF in the first place? Like what is your, what is your plan? So, so the trap, it, we're going to be sending traffic. Mm. Yeah. So as soon as okay. this, it's, I guess it's like three part, maybe four, but first part, build the sales system, which is the foundation, build mm-hmm. the marketing system and then yeah, start, start the traffic. Cool. Mm-hmm. Exciting, um, man. And you know, I want to get into, you mentioned many chat, like, yeah. Tell me about your experience with, with many chat and uh, for our listeners like let them into what many chat is i guess um so many chat is a messenger uh integration uh facebook messenger integration where you're able to build these uh chat bot sequences um so that people can uh so that customers can pretty much interact with your messaging and also your brand in a much more automated fashion. Um, so the cool thing about ManyChat is, or I guess I should say messenger marketing in general, is that you could have those one-to-one deep conversations, um, whether it be you know uh, just plainly customer service, FAQs, like what we have uh, for Lead Next Gen, or you can also customize messaging depending on what part of uh, the customer uh, funnel that they're in, right? Um, and I guess this kind of goes back to uh, how I was reaching out to people one-on-one in the DMs. I truly believe that conversational marketing is probably one of the next evolutions in marketing. Um, and it's also a great way to uh, capture emails as well. Um, as we're taught, like whenever we capture an email, we kind of grow our own sort of traffic source. Right. Um, and we, we, we grow, we grow our subscriber, uh, base. So we can email our, our, our subscribers in any time that we want. Um, when it comes to messenger marketing, we're kind of under that whole Facebook umbrella. So we don't essentially own the traffic really, and there's definitely uh, some rules that we need to play within the, uh, to play within the Facebook playground, but it's still a great way to get in front of potential clients or potential uh, customers uh, because you're interacting with them in a platform that they interact with their friends and family on. They're super comfortable with it um, and they're, you know, everybody is really just tapped into messenger. Do you have like an example of where messenger marketing has completely blown email marketing out of the water? Um, 
I wouldn't, I mean, people, people always make the, the distinction between the two. Right. But I, I, I still feel like you can still, uh, capture the email, uh, within the messenger sequence. Right. And I, that that's absolutely critical. Like I said, it's, you don't own the, the trap or you don't own that. I don't want to say own, but, um, <laughs> you don't get the subscriber, uh, into your own traffic source if you don't uh, capture the email in the first place. But um, I think statistics say that like a really, really good email open rate is about like 20%. If you have a 20% open rate, that's like really, really good, right? On an email campaign. Uh, I think when it comes to messenger marketing, the average is around like 60 to 70%. Uh, and that's because, you know, one, it's pretty new. I think it's, it started maybe in 2017. Um, and two, you're interacting with them uh, in a platform that, you know, like I said before, that their friends and family are on. Um, and if you're serving uh, personalized messaging um, in short form or that also has uh, integrated quick replies or buttons where, you know, you, users can just like select and you can kind of lead them down um, in a sort of like quiz sort of engaging format that usually drives up uh, at least more brand trust. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's fascinating. And yeah, that's what I'm pretty much building my agency on. Do you think um, messenger marketing can ever feel like actually talking to a person? Um, I, there's definitely companies out there that are integrating the whole AI experience into uh, messenger. So it's definitely going towards that. Um, and I think messenger marketing, you know, Gary V talks, is, talks about this most of the time, but uh, when it comes to voice, um, you know, the use of Google Assistant, um, Siri, Alexa, um, all of that is just, you know, conversational marketing. It's just with a even more robust AI, right? So if you're able to at least integrate some sort of conversational marketing, whether it be through a chat bot or whatever, I feel like, you know, that plus more robust AI systems uh, could lead into that sort of natural uh in, into that sort of progression. I think one company that I heard of through a different podcast was Octane AI, and that's uh, primarily a, uh, a chatbot AI specifically for e-commerce, and it links directly to your Shopify. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't really spent too much time with that, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think services like that beyond just ManyChat uh, will start popping up specific to different sorts, sorts of niches and would be really, really uh, beneficial for uh, some marketers to stay ahead of the curve and to go deep with their, with their customer segments. So for the marketers not using um, messenger marketing right now, what do you think they should be? What's like the first five things they should be doing or, you know, preparing um, to do? Well, one is if they have a FAQ page uh, or if they have like customer service uh, that they can pretty much automate, I, I think that, that would be the first thing to do is maybe set up a customer service bot through ManyChat. And you don't really need to buy, um, I think ManyChat is like $10 a month for a pro account. Um, you can essentially sign up for free and create your own uh, you know, customer service bot, right. That will take care of, uh, any of the, the little automations that are the little things that an actual person doesn't need to be there for. Right. Um, for example, I guess local, local businesses, right. Like a, a, a restaurant. I remember maybe like two weeks ago, I messaged a restaurant for, um, on Facebook, I messaged them for, you know, their menu or if they were open today for like the holiday or whatever, right? Very basic customer service stuff. 
and they didn't respond to me for like the next three days. Um, so I mean, <laughs> eventually I still made it to that restaurant maybe like a couple hours later. Uh, but you know, it would have been nice to actually have that kind of automated customer service, um, in there. Yeah. And I know that's just one example, but, uh, this could apply to any other, uh, business beyond just like, uh, physical locations. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you need to have a lot of traffic going to your site in order to implement this stuff? Like when is, what is that point for a marketer to be like, okay, now is the time I should start implementing messenger marketing. I don't think you need, um, well, it depends on definitely how much you leverage, uh, digital media into your marketing. Right. Um, for example, I don't like a prime client, um, for me, would wouldn't be someone that doesn't spend any uh any money on on marketing ads in the first place right um for example like if they're if they're writing digital ads you can actually create a digital ad that just says send to messenger right and they would start that conversation automatically as opposed to um it being an ad that just goes to your I don't know, a product page or your home page where they actually have to, you know, you collect an email opt-in from there. It's like, why don't you just try and qualify your lead right then and there through a messenger sequence. And then if they want to get to know more about your brand or your product, then you can, you know, send them out to whatever website page or whatever uh, funnel you want. Um, so it help, definitely helps in pre-qualifying. And I don't think that, too many businesses do that or maybe know that they can do that up front. Um, so I think it's, it's a great way to get the conversation going with, uh, potential customers or potential clients. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. And the last question, um, what would you tell your younger, like your younger self? I mean, it's still something that I uh, contend with uh, day by day, but um, it's just being just being purely patient. And to this sounds super cliche, but I'm going to say it anyways. Say is it. to <laughs> is to go after what you really want to what you really want to do, and to not like. Uh, beat around the bush or feel like you shouldn't go after something because it's not cool or um, it might be too hard or other people just don't think it's worthwhile. Um, And, you know, I guess this stems from the fact that, you know, when I went to, when I went to university, um, growing up in an Asian household, I was kind of pushed towards a very uh, stable career choice right? And, you know, me and my buddy Rob, like we came across internet marketing, studying abroad in in our junior year, our third year. And automatically, we wanted to change our majors to, you know, advertising or or marketing, right? But we had to stick with biochemistry, because that's what that's what we were doing. And we were already hitting upper divs. And I feel like we wasted a lot of time. Um, We knew what we wanted. And it's weird how life works because that's eventually what came out as the truth on the end, right? Um, But we definitely wasted maybe a good amount of time, um, I guess, dabbling in in things that weren't for us. But we, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Um, You know what you want because you've dabbled into stuff that you clearly aren't, right? Uh, so that brought us a lot of clarity and who knows if, if we didn't go that way, but at the same time, you know, once you know where you want to go, uh, and it, it's, it's funny how we were talking about like direction and everything earlier. Um, once you know where you want to go, it's just a matter of just doing the work and getting there. Right. Uh, but also coupled with the patience that you're not going to get everything that you want right then and there, even if you put in 
all of the work within one week, right? Like uh, there's always an ultimate potential that you're always striving for your metaphorical North star or whatever. Um, but that's a very, very long journey and you're not going to get everything and you're definitely going to have setbacks, right? Uh, on the way to get there, you might have some detours and you might change your mind, but having the patience to recognize that you are still heading in that direction, even with the setbacks is something that I would, uh, remind myself early on, you know, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I love it, dude. <laughs> Thanks so much, Glenn. Where can people find you? Um, you can find me on uh, iTunes uh, or Google Podcast. Uh, just search for the Nomad Wolf Podcast. Um, you can also connect with me on, I guess, my website. Uh, it's glennand.co, G-L-E-N-N-A-N-D.co. Um, you can find me on Facebook and you can find me on Instagram at Stokes. That's it. That's S T O K E S dot Z I P. Um, yeah. And I look forward to connecting with you all. If you decide to reach out. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Glenn. No worries. Thanks Ronnie.